Good morning and welcome to Trinity Church Online. It is wonderful to be together this morning. Welcome to Trinity Church. If you are new this morning, a special welcome to you. Uh, and you'll want to know that part of the way we come together as a group in this strange online world is to uh, read off the same page. So you may want to get the PDF file that we have posted in the comments section. You can simply open it as a window on your uh, computer or your device. Uh, I like to print mine out so I can scribble things and so forth. But however you manage it, you will find it useful to have a copy of it in front of you one way or another. You want to be able to see the words and maybe even see the music. Um, when we sing hymns, the words for the hymns are part of the video that brings you the, the music to sing along to, but you might want to read the notation. So that's in the PDF file. Uh, announcements are there also and other useful things. So by all means, get yourself settled with a copy of the PDF file in front of you somehow and begin to invite your soul to, to be fully present, your spirit to be fully present. One of the ways that we do that here at Trinity is to listen to some beautiful music. This morning, the prelude is Matt Harris and Krista Seddon playing Beautiful Love. With you, let us pray together the centering prayer, which is the wonderful poem, Come My Way, My Truth, by the poet George Herbert. Let us pray. Come my way, my truth, my life, such a way as gives us breath, such a truth as ends all strife, such a life as killeth death. 
Come, my light, my feast, my strength, such a light as shows a feast, such a feast as men's in length, such a strength as makes his guest. Come, my joy, my love, my heart, such a joy as none can move, such a love as none can part, such a heart as joys in love. Amen. So let me say welcome again to Trinity Church, as some of you have been coming in during the prelude. If you haven't already gotten yourself a copy of the PDF worship guide, you should do that. If you print it out, it'll look like this. If you don't print it out, it'll still look like that, but it'll be on your computer screen. So either way you like it, it's fine. And as a further invitation to being really present as a part of this online group, as this online congregation gathered for worship, let me invite you to make your presence known in the comment section, as many of you have already done. Um, everybody just sort of checks in and greets and says hello, do that. And then during the course of the service, feel free to share your thoughts and feelings as the service goes along. And when we get to the time when we're praying for each other and for the world, verbalize those prayers in the comment section as much as you feel conf comfortable doing so knowing that that is the place where our togetherness is embodied. Um, we're a little disembodied on the internet. You can see my picture, but I can't see yours, or you can't see each other's, but you can see each other's words and share each other's concerns there in the comments section. So please feel free to do that actively. Also, in spite of the fact that you won't hear anybody else singing except the soloists from the choir, we sing out loud together for the opening hymn and there'll be an, an extra little hymn, uh, the wonderful day by day from Godspell will sneak in there after the gospel and before the sermon. And then we'll sing a final hymn together at the end. Sing those hymns out loud, sing like you're in the shower, sing like you could actually hear each other in person if we could all be together. Don't feel self-conscious, just belt it out it is time to do that now.
first reading is from Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, God appeared and said, I am El Shaddai. Walk in my presence and be blameless. I will make a covenant between you and me, and I will increase your number exceedingly. Abram fell on his face before God, and God said to him, this is my covenant with you. You will be the ancestor of many nations. You are no longer to be called Abram, respected parent, but Abraham, progenitor of a multitude, for you are the progenitor of a multitude of nations. I will make you most fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and rulers will spring from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and descendants after you for generations to come. I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God continued, as for Sarai, her name will now be Sarah, noble woman. I will bless her and she will become nations. Rulers of peoples will come from her. Hear what the spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The middle reading is a poem called Dream Me God by Dorothy Soul. It's not you who should solve my problems, God, but I yours, God of the asylum seekers. It's not you who should feed the hungry, but I who should protect your children. From the terror of the banks of armies, it's not you who should make room for the refugees, but I who should receive you, hardly hidden God of the desolate. You dreamed me, God, practicing walking upright and learning to kneel down, more beautiful than I am now, happier than I dare to be, freer than our country allows. Don't stop dreaming me, God. I don't want to stop remembering that I am your tree, planted by the streams of living water. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Today's reading is from Mark. Then Jesus began to teach them that the promised one had to suffer much, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and religious scholars, be put to death and rise again three days later. Jesus said these things quite openly. Peter then took him aside and began to take issue with him. At this, Jesus turned around and eyeing the disciples, reprimanded Peter. Get out of my sight, you Satan. You are judging by human standards rather than by God's. Jesus summoned the crowd and the disciples and said, if you wish to come after me, you must deny your very self. Take up your cross and follow in my footsteps. If you would save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will save it. What would you gain if you were to win the whole world but lose yourself in the process. What can you offer in exchange for your soul? Whoever in, his, in this faithless and corrupt generation is ashamed of me and my words will find in turn that the promised one and the holy angels will be ashamed of that person when all stand before our God in glory. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Many of you have told me that you have received one or both doses of a COVID-19 vaccine, and I am so happy to hear it. I want to get vaccinated as soon as possible, too, but I'm not eligible yet. And I feel really lucky to be at the back of the line to get vaccinated. I want to get vaccinated, but I'm at the back of the line, and I'm fine with that because if you're at the back of the line, it's because you're in good health and have a relatively low risk of being exposed and a low risk of getting really sick or dying if you do get infected. I'm in that category, yay me. I have no hesitation about getting vaccinated and I'm looking forward to it when I can, but I'm content to wait my turn. With every one of you that gets vaccinated ahead of me, my risk of getting sick goes down anyway. So you go, I'll catch up later. Here's the kicker though, since I can't get vaccinated yet, when you have been vaccinated, please keep wearing your mask when you're around anybody outside your pod or bubble. From what I've been learning, the vaccine revs up our immune system to suppress and kill the virus after we've been infected so that we don't get very sick. That's awesome. If you've been vaccinated and you happen to be exposed to the vaccine, you're almost certain to survive and you probably won't even feel sick. That's what we want. The thing is though, the vaccine doesn't prevent you from taking in the virus if you get exposed. It has to get into you for the vaccine and for your immune system to rev up and fight it off. The scientists I've heard interviewed have said, you probably will be a little contagious for a little while after you do get infected. You get infected and then you fight it off. And during that time, you may not feel sick, but you probably do carry the vaccine, the, the virus, and have the potential of spreading it to somebody who is not immune. Eventually, the prevalence of the virus will go way down because it won't be able to spread or replicate very effectively. Herd immunity really is a thing, and we'll get there. But in the meantime, we're all still potential spreaders. Aren't you glad you asked? You didn't? Well, anyway, I'm glad I told you. But why am I talking about this? Here's why. If God is worth worshiping, then God is in the middle of this mess somewhere. This is where we find God. That's why I'm talking about this, because this is where we find God. In the first reading, God said to Abraham, who at age 99 had no children, God said to Abraham and to Sarah, I will make a covenant between you and me. I will increase your number exceedingly. This is my covenant with you. You will be the ancestors of many nations. I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. If you think of a covenant as some kind of deal or contract, this is a weird one. More than just a magical promise to make descendants out of nothing, God places no expectation on Abraham and Sarah. God doesn't say, I'll make you the ancestor of a nation if and as long as you do such and such. God simply says, this is my covenant. I will be your God and the God of descendants that you don't even think you'll ever have. In other words, it's a unilateral. Without a promise from you in return. We normally think of a covenant as an exchange of promises. All kinds of wonderful things come out of such exchanges. Bonds of loyalty and mutual support are fostered by such exchanges. Teamwork and collaboration are built on such promises. 
but there is also the possibility of something less than wonderful built into such two-way exchanges. At the center of the exchange is possibly the motivation of self-benefit. I'll do this for you in order to get you to do that for me. I really only value you for what you can do for me. I'm willing to do something for you, but it's really all about getting something out of you. The pattern that God shows consistently throughout the Bible is different. God makes a one-sided unilateral promise without requiring a matching promise from the other. That is, that changes everything. To see what it changes, don't focus on the content of the promises, the magical things, like giving Abraham and Sarah a child at the age of 99 years, or cursing Egypt with seven plagues, or dividing the Red Sea, or making water gush out of the rock in the desert. Rather, think about what it means that God's covenant is a unilateral, unconditional promise. What does it say about God's motivation? God makes a promise to Abraham and Sarah, or later into the story, their descendants, generation after generation after generation, purely for their benefit, not for God's. Because God values them simply for existing. When God promises them simply something, <clears throat> it is simply a gift. By contrast, if someone gives you a present and you realize that you now feel that you owe them a present in return, then somewhere along the line, you came to believe that it wasn't actually a gift, but a purchase price for something you would be obligated to deliver in the future. Whether the giver intended it that way and let you understand it, or whether you simply carry a heavy burden of guilt from the way you were brought up, the joy if I may say so, is sapped out of the exchange. But God doesn't want to get anything from Sarah and Abraham. God simply wants it to happen and wants them to be happy. God simply wants to be their God, and God simply wants them to find joy in that fact. Let's do a little math. If I give you something, no, let me start again. If you give me something and I think, boy, this is wonderful, and I give you something in return, then we're even. That is, we're back to zero. You give me something and I give you something, we're back where we started. It's almost as if nothing happened. It's kind of deadly. By contrast, if you give me something for the joy of it, and that's all there is to it, and I don't do a thing, we've gone from zero to plus one. As I said earlier, if I give you something in return, we're back to zero. But instead, if I am inspired by your example. And I think, wow, the world is a better place because you gave somebody a gift. I happened to be the recipient, so I'm aware of it. But what's wonderful is that you did a giving. You did a thing. And if I'm inspired by your example and I do something generous as well for somebody else or even for you, but I do it simply because I'm inspired by your model of generosity, not to return the favor, but simply to continue the process. Then we've gone from plus one to plus two, more life. That's the pattern of God's covenants in the Bible. They are gifts outright, and they are life-giving. I see the same pattern in Dorothy Sill's middle reading, as she says, you dreamed me, God, me practicing walking upright and learning to kneel down more beautiful than I am now, happier than I dare to be, 
freer than our country allows. God's covenant frees us to live with joy and to love each other. Rather than approaching our relationships as nothing but the means of getting what we want for ourselves, God's covenant leads us to organize our approach to our relationships as a way to find joy and happiness beyond our own limitations. Let's face it, if I am the center of the universe, the universe is very small indeed. I don't know if human beings are capable of purely selfless altruism. So far, the only evidence I can see in my own behavior suggests it is not possible. Even when I am altruistic, it's never purely so. Even so, believing that God gives us life as a gift does draw me out of myself and out of the very small universe I can construct on my own. So simply by promising to be my God, to be your God, to be our God from Abraham and Sarah onward, God is in the middle of the mess of our lives. It's a mess because we make it so. It's a mess because we make our lives looking to each other to be useful or worried that each other are dangerous as good for us or bad for us, rather than as marvelously made, beautiful and lovable. That's how God sees us. But God is present by promise in our lives, promising to be our God because God knows we are marvelously made and beautiful and lovable. That promise makes it possible for us to love each other and value something more than our own selves. It makes it possible for us to give freely and receive without any burden of guilt. So here we are at this really messy time in history, at this really messy moment when we all depend on each other more than ever, even though in our country we're struggling to live as if we depend on each other. But the vaccine is rolling out. It's getting to you and your neighbor and the one beyond them and on and on and eventually to me. Vaccines are a life, are a gift that is life giving, literally, right? If you get vaccinated, you receive the gift of life. Not only will you not get sick, but your anxiety and stress level will go down and you will be much closer to getting back to the life that you had to give up a year ago. The science says that we can't go back to things completely yet. We still need to wear masks, as I mentioned before. But if the great majority of us get vaccinated, the virus won't have enough host sites to thrive and its presence in our population will go way down, maybe not to zero, but way down. So on the one hand, if you get vaccinated, you'll be safe and eventually life will get back to normal. But even when it becomes safe to go out of your house again, your universe may remain small. On the other hand, if you get vaccinated and keep wearing your mask until I can get vaccinated and you do it because you care about me, then eventually life will do more than get back to normal. Life will move forward and your universe will expand like the many nations that are the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and Sarah. It is not you who should solve my problems, God, but I yours, God of asylum seekers. It is not you who should feed the hungry, but I who should protect your children from the terror of the banks and armies. It is not you who should make room for the refugees, but I who should receive you, hardly hidden God of the desolate. Don't stop, stop dreaming me, God. I don't want to stop remembering that I am your tree 
planted by the streams of living water. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith found on page five. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Let me invite you to join together in praying for each other and for the world, for your own needs and concerns for that matter. I'm gonna light a candle. I invite you to do the same if you are set up to do that and not to worry about it if you're not. My candle will do for all of us. And I also invite you to sing uh, the responses along with Krista. We will not hear other voices because Krista's playing the responses live. Wave at me, Krista. There you are, see? So we're really here, in fact. And that's wonderful. The only disadvantage is you don't get to hear other singers than yourself. If Krista will give me the first note, I'll just run through the melody once and then uh, I'll start the prayers and we'll, we'll do the, the refrains uh, together after that. That's my note. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible. With God. So you hear, you don't have to be a wonderful singer to do this. Just jump in when Krista plays the piano, okay? I won't sing because then our timing will get off and mess everything up. But you sing with Krista and it will work just fine. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Christ took five loaves and two fish, blessed and broke them and fed a crowd. No one understood, but all were included. Christ rubbed mud on the eyes of someone who was blind. 
No one understood, but the person began to see. Upon waking in the middle of a storm, Christ told the wind and waves to be quiet. No one understood, but all became calm again. Christ could outwit the high and mighty, but when it came to showing who was greatest in the eyes of God, Christ took a child in his lap. We look at people around us and even in the mirror and see how fear and pride divide our communities. We see how greed and the turning of a blind eye degrade the natural world and leave vulnerable people destitute. We worry about loved ones facing illness or danger. We worry about those who struggle to make ends meet. We grieve the loss of those we loved but see no longer, wondering how we will get through tomorrow. We marvel at the raw power and beauty mixed together in a winter sky. We are grateful for everything that sustains us. We thrill at the creativity of the human spirit and we are warmed by the kindness and understanding we receive from each other. We seek wisdom and compassion to guide us in our common life and hope for the courage to build a more just society. Christ offered freedom to people who had become trapped by the cruelty of others and even to people who had become trapped by their own bad choices. Christ begged to be spared the cross, yet found the strength to go willingly and showed that even in death, all things are possible with God. peace of the Lord be always with you. Please greet one another in the name of the Lord. Use the comment section, greet each other, continue to share your prayers as we hear some music. <laughs> Thank you. 
Peace be with you all. It's great to be together online, and I want to uh, make a couple of announcements about what else is going on in the life of Trinity Church. Um, we will gather, switch online platforms to gather with a little more face-to-face, -face, even though it's through tiny little screens. Uh, we'll gather on Zoom immediately following the postlude at the end of this time of prayer and reflection and music on Facebook Live. And I want to uh, invite you and encourage you to move from Facebook to Zoom to join the um, online gathering afterwards. We'll have a simple short form of communion together and then some conversation. And because of something that took place at Trinity earlier this week, an event that most of you probably know about, the, the Zoom gathering with the author Debbie Irving, who wrote the book, Waking Up White and Finding Myself in the Story of Race. She did a wonderful presentation and there was a, a great uh, exchange of thoughts and ideas afterwards. Um, and it's the, that's, that's a, a starting point. That kind of thing is always the first step, never the final step. And so we wanted to make it possible for a conversation to continue. And Sunday right after, after church is usually the best time for people to get together. So after we have communion uh, and a little just sort of, hey, how are you, check in time with everybody who's gathered, we'll start talking about the, the matters that Debbie Irving's book brought up. I know many of you have read the book and even if you haven't, or even if you didn't get to the program on Wednesday night, figuring out how to move together forward out of racism is something that we all think about and all can think about and need to think about starting with wherever we are thinking about it. So don't feel like, oh, that's for those people who did that thing. It's for, it's for all of us, anybody who wants to, as I said, we'll start out with online communion. We'll have a few minutes just to check in with each other and then um, start to share further thoughts of that uh, may have been sparked by the Wednesday night event. And anybody is welcome to continue that conversation and to join it, even if you weren't there Wednesday night. So I really, really hope you will feel welcome. And, you know, like I actually mean the invitation uh, to be there. I'd love to see you there. Um, the When you need the Zoom link to get in, it'll be in the comments section. All, more conversation opportunities. On Tuesday evenings through Lent, uh, Jeff Took and Tim Lane are leading a, a, a program of conversations on civil discourse called Make Me an Instrument of Peace. It's based on a series of short videos to spark conversation that were prepared by some office in the presiding bishop's office in the Episcopal Church. Uh, they're off to a great start. They started last Tuesday night and are looking forward to continuing. And But each each Tuesday evening is self-sufficient. So it's, it's not a problem if you weren't there last Tuesday, you can start this Tuesday. If you miss next Tuesday, you can come back the Tuesday after that. It's all good. So when you can come, make sure to come. Um, the, the Zoom link for that is not gonna be in the comment section because you don't need it now. It's in the PDF file that I keep waving around uh, on the announcements page at the back. If you have that PDF file as a document on your computer, those links are hot. You can click on them. And uh, so keep that PDF file nearby. And on Tuesday evening, click on that link to join Jeff and Tim in their Zoom gathering to take part in that conversation. Third thing I wanna mention is that we are in the getting ready phase for a takeout dinner fundraising event, which will happen later this month. Um, we are partnering with Osteria 166 for doing this. 
they were a great restaurant before the pandemic hit, but when the pandemic shut everything down, they pivoted to providing frozen dinners <clears throat> in individual servings and and multiple servings up to big sheets for big groups. Um, and so we're partnering with them. You can stock your freezer with their good food and in so doing generate income to help support Trinity and also um, help support people with meals because Osteria 166 is giving a hundred meals to Compass House and to uh, Home Space, the two programs, uh, residential programs that we support. And so they're already gonna provide 100 meals to those two places. And if you would like to provide additional meals when you order your own online, you can order more and they will be included in the delivery that will go to Compass House and to um, Home Space. So please feel free to support them that way. You'll also be supporting Trinity. If you simply wanna make a cash gift that helps Trinity because gee, this is a good idea, go ahead and do that too. All those things are possible. Speaking of which, if you support Trinity financially already, keep doing it. Your support is crucial. If you haven't started supporting Trinity financially, you got to start somewhere. And today would be a great day. You can click the link in the comment section to donate online. If you prefer to mail a check to the church, that will get there eventually and we'll cash it eventually. It doesn't happen very often because we only collect those checks once a week on Mondays and then they get mailed out to our bookkeeper who cashes them and so forth. Anyway, it's all a process, but it does happen. So you should feel confident about making a gift either online or by mailing a check. Either way will work. And your support for Trinity Church and for our ministries is crucial and really meaningful and really helpful. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of this community in all the ways that you are, including by your financial support. Our financial offerings are only part of what we really do as a congregation. We give our lives for the good of the world. That's what it is to be a church. And we give helpfulness to our neighbors. We give wearing masks to help everybody. And we give beauty to the world. And one of the ways Trinity does that is musically. So what you're about to hear as, an, as a, uh, a choral performance is your musical offering. So I hope you will take joy in it and think of it as a way of thanking God for being God. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Now, as Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, holy and blessed is your true name. We pray for your reign of peace to come. We pray that your good will be done. Let heaven and earth become one. Give us this day the bread we need. Give it to those who have none. Let forgiveness flow like a river between us from each one to each one. Lead us to holy innocence beyond all the evil of our days. Come swiftly, Mother, Father, come, for yours is the power and the glory and the mercy. Forever your name is all in one. Amen. Gracious God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Life is short. We do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who make the journey with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may the blessing of God who made us, who loves us, and who animates and guides us be with you now and always. Amen. Join in singing the final hymn.
Following this dismissal, Paul Cena will play a beautiful piece of J.S. Bach music as postlude. And then after that, we will gather in Zoom. As I said, the, the link is in the comment section and I look forward to seeing you there. Take your leave, trusting that we are made one in Christ to shine in the world with God's light. <laughs>